dear students welcome to this session on the topic primary structure of proteins first of all let us see what are proteins proteins are macromolecules that carry all of a cells activities it is estimated that typical mammalian cells has over 1 lakh different proteins having a diverse array of functions as enzymes proteins vastly accelerate the rate of metabolic reactions as structural cables provide mechanical support both within cells and outside as hormones growth factors and gene activators proteins perform a wide variety of regulatory functions as membrane receptors and transporters proteins determine what a cell reacts to and what type substances enter or leave the cell as contractile filaments and molecular motors protein constitute the machinery for biological movements among many functions protein act as antibodies serve as toxins form blood clots absorbs or refract light and transport substances from one part of body to another each protein has highly unique and ordered structure that enables to carry out a particular function protein structure can be described at several levels of organizations each emphasizing a different aspect and each dependent on different types of interactions customarily four such levels are described primary secondary tertiary and quaternary the primary structure concerns amino acid sequence of a protein whereas the later three levels concern the organization of molecule in the space here we can see a schematic representation of primary secondary tertiary and quaternary structure of proteins the spatial arrangement of atoms in a protein is called its conformation the possible conformations of a protein include any structural state that can be achieved without breaking covalent bonds a change in conformation could occur for example by rotation about single bonds of the numerous conformations that are theoretically possible in a protein containing hundreds of single bonds one or more commonly a few generally predominate under biological conditions proteins in any of their functional folded conformations are called native proteins now let us see primary structure of proteins in detail the primary structure of a polypeptide is the specific linear sequence of amino acids that constitute the chain and the location of any disulfide bridges the information for precise order of amino acids in every protein that an organism can produce is encoded within the genome of that organism The amino acid sequence provides the information required to determine the molecule's 3D shape and function. Biologically occurring polypeptides range in size from small to very large, consisting of 2 or 3 to thousands of linked amino acid residues. Two amino acid molecules can be covalently joined through a substituted amide linkage termed a peptide bond to yield a dipeptide. Such a linkage is formed by removal of water or dehydration from the alpha carboxyl group of one amino acid and the alpha amino group of another. Peptide bond formation is an example of a condensation reaction, a common class of reactions in living cells. Here we can find a schematic representation for the formation of a peptide bond. Three amino acids can be joined by two peptide bonds to form a tripeptide. Similarly, amino acids can be linked to form tetrapeptides, pentapeptides, and so forth. When a few amino acids are joined in this fashion, the structure is called an oligopeptide. When many amino acids are joined, the product is called a polypeptide. Most natural polypeptide chains contain between 50 and 2000 amino acids and are commonly referred to as proteins. Proteins may have thousands of amino acid residues. 
although the terms protein and polypeptide are sometimes used interchangeably, molecules referred to as polypeptides generally have molecular weights below 10,000 kilo Dalton and those called proteins have higher molecular weights. An amino acid unit in a peptide is often called a residue. In a peptide, the amino acid residue at the end with a free alpha amino group is the amino terminal or N terminal residue. The residue at the other end which has a free carboxyl group is the carboxy terminal or C terminal residue. Although hydrolysis of a peptide bond is an hexagonic reaction, it occurs slowly because of its high activation energy. As a result, the peptide bonds in proteins are quite stable with an average half life or T half of about 7 years under most intracellular conditions. The carbons of adjacent amino acid residues are separated by three covalent bonds arranged as C alpha, C and C alpha. There is partial sharing of two pairs of electrons between the carbonyl oxygen and the amide nitrogen. The oxygen has a partial negative charge and the nitrogen a partial positive charge setting up a small electric dipole. The six atoms of the peptide group lie in a single plane in such a way that the oxygen atom of the carbonyl group and the hydrogen atom of the amide nitrogen are trans to each other. From this it is clear that the peptide carbon nitrogen bonds are unable to rotate freely because of their partial double bond character. Rotation is permitted about the NC alpha and the C alpha C bonds. The backbone of a polypeptide chain can thus be pictured as a series of rigid planes separated by substituted methylene groups or CHR sharing a common point of rotation at C alpha. The rigid peptide bonds limit the range of conformations that can be assumed by a polypeptide chain. By convention, the bond angles resulting from rotations at C alpha are labeled phi for the NC alpha bond and psi for the C alpha C bond. Again, by convention, both phi and psi are defined as 180 degree when the polypeptide is in its fully extended conformation and all peptide groups are in the same plane. In principle, Phi and sin can have any value between minus 180 to plus 180 degree, but many values are prohibited by steric interference between atoms in the polypeptide backbone and amino acid side chains. The conformation in which both phi and psi are 0 degree is prohibited for this reason. This conformation is used merely as a reference point for describing the angles of rotation. Allowed values of phi and psi are graphically revealed when phi is plotted versus psi in the Ramachandran plot introduced by G. N. Ramachandran. Amino acid sequence and its role in protein functions. Let us see this topic in detail. The amino acid sequence provides the information required to determine the molecule's 3D structure and shape and thus function. Various changes that arise in the sequence as a result of genetic mutation in the DNA may not be readily tolerated. The earliest and best studied example for this relationship is the change in amino acid sequence of hemoglobin that causes the disease sickle cell anemia. This severe inherited anemia results solely from a single amino acid change within the hemoglobin molecule. A non-polar valine residue is present where a charged glutamic acid is normally located. This change in hemoglobin can have different effect on the shape of red blood cells converting them from disc shaped cells to sickle shaped cells which tend to clog small blood vessels causing pain and life threatening crisis. Biologically active peptides. 
many small peptides exert their effects at very low concentrations. Oxytocin which is a 9 amino acid residue protein which is secreted by the posterior pituitary and stimulates uterine contractions. Bradykinin which is a 9 residue protein which inhibits the inflammation of tissues and thyrotropin releasing factor which is a 3 residue which is formed in the hypothalamus and stimulates the release of another hormone thyrotropin from the anterior pituitary gland. Some extremely toxic mushroom poisons such as amanitin are also small peptides as are many antibiotics. Slightly larger are small polypeptides and oligopeptides such as the pancreatic hormone insulin which contains two polypeptide chains one having 30 amino acid residues and the other 21. Glucagon another pancreatic hormone has 29 residues and it opposes the action of insulin. Corticotropin is a 39 residue hormone of the anterior pituitary gland that stimulates the adrenal cortex. Human cytochrome C has 104 amino acid residues linked in a single chain. Bovine chymotrypsinogen has 245 residues. At the extreme is titin also known as connectin a giant protein which is a constituent of vertebrate muscle and has nearly 27,000 amino acid residues and a molecular weight more than 3000 kilodalton. The vast majority of naturally occurring proteins are much smaller than this containing fewer than 2000 amino acid residues. Now let us see peptide sequencing. Frederick Sanger worked out the sequence of amino acid residues in the polypeptide chains of the hormone insulin. Amino acid sequence of thousands of different proteins from many species have been determined using principles first developed by Sanger. These methods are still in use although with many variations and improvements in detail. Chemical protein sequencing now complements a growing list of newer methods providing multiple avenues to obtain amino acid sequence data. Such data are now critical to every area of biochemical investigation. Sanger developed the reagent 1-fluoro-2,4-dinitrobenzene for this purpose. Other reagents used to label the amino terminal residue Dancyl chloride and dapsyl chloride yield derivatives that are most easily detectable than the dinitrophenyl derivatives. After the amino terminal residue is labeled with one of these reagents, the polypeptide has hydrolyzed to its constituent amino acids and the labeled amino acid is identified. Because the hydrolysis stage destroys the polypeptide, this procedure cannot be used to sequence a polypeptide beyond its amino terminal residue. However, it can help to determine the number of chemically distinct polypeptides in a protein provided each has a different amino terminal residue. To sequence an entire polypeptide, a chemical method devised by Edman is usually employed. The Edman degradation procedure labels and removes only the amino terminal residue from a peptide leaving all other peptide bonds intact. The peptide is reacted with phenyl isothiocyanate under mildly alkaline conditions which converts the amino terminal amino acid to a phenyl thiocarbamyl adduct. The peptide bond next to the PTC adduct is then cleaved in a step carried out in an anhydrous trifluoroacetic acid with removal of the amino terminal amino acid as an anilinothiazolinone derivative. The derivatized amino acid is extracted with organic solvents converted to the more stable phenylthiohydantoin derivative by treatment with aqueous acid and then identified. Here you can see an overview of the peptide sequencing. The use of sequential reactions carried out under first basic and then acidic conditions provides control over the entire process. 
each reaction with the amino terminal amino acid can go essentially to completion without affecting any of the other peptide bonds in the peptide. After removal and identification of the amino terminal residue, the new amino terminal residue so exposed can be labeled, removed and identified through the same series of reactions. This procedure is repeated until the entire sequence is determined. The Edmund degradation is carried out on a machine called a sequenator that mixes reagents in the proper proportions, separates the products, identifies them and records the results. These methods are extremely sensitive. Often the complete amino acid sequence can be determined starting with only a few micrograms of protein. The length of polypeptide that can be accurately sequenced by the Edmund degradation depends on the efficiency of the individual chemical steps. Consider a peptide beginning with the sequence glycine proline lysine at its amino terminus. If glycine were removed with 97 percentage efficiency, 3 percentage of the polypeptide molecules in the solution would retain a glycine residue at their amino terminus. In the second Edman cycle, 97 percentage of the liberated amino acids would be proline and 3 percentage glycine, while 3 percentage of the polypeptide molecules would retain glycine. 0.1 percentage or proline 2.9 percentage residues at their amino terminus. At each cycle, peptides that did not react in earlier cycles would contribute amino acids to an ever increasing background, eventually making it impossible to determine which amino acid is next in the original peptide sequence. Modern sequenators achieve efficiencies of better than 99 percentage per cycle, permitting the sequencing of more than 50 contiguous amino acid residues in a polypeptide. The primary structure of insulin worked out, worked out by Sanger and colleagues over a period of 10 years could now be a completely determined in a day or two. The development of rapid DNA sequencing methods, the elucidation of the genetic code and the development of techniques for isolating genes, researchers can deduce the sequence of polypeptide by determining the sequence of nucleotides in the gene that codes for it. The techniques used to determine protein and DNA sequences are complementary. When the gene is available, sequencing the DNA can be faster and more accurate than sequencing the protein. Most proteins are now sequenced in this indirect way. If the gene has not been isolated, direct sequencing of peptides is necessary and this can provide information. The duplication of the disulfide bonds for example, not available in the DNA sequence. In addition, knowledge of the amino acid sequence of even a part of polypeptide can greatly facilitate the isolation of the corresponding gene. Genes are being discovered by the millions including many that encode proteins with no function. To describe the entire protein complement encoded by an organism's DNA, researchers have coined the term proteome. Now let us see peptide synthesis in detail. Many peptides are potentially useful as pharmacological agents and their production is of considerable commercial importance. There are three ways to obtain a peptide. One, purification from tissue, a task often made difficult by the vanishingly low concentrations of some peptides. Two, genetic engineering or three, direct chemical synthesis. Powerful techniques now make direct chemical synthesis an attractive option in many cases. In addition to commercial applications, the synthesis of specific peptide portions of larger proteins is an increasingly important tool for the study of protein structure and function. The major breakthrough in chemical synthesis was provided by R. Bruce Murray Field in 1962. His innovation involved synthesizing a peptide 
while keeping it attached at one end to a solid support. The support in is an insoluble polymer or resin contained within a column similar to that used for chromatographic procedures. The peptide is built up on this support by adding one amino acid at a time using a standard set of reactions in a repeating cycle. At each successive step in the cycle, protective chemical groups block unwanted reactions. How are these peptides constructed? The amino group of one amino acid is linked to the carboxyl group of another. However, a unique product is formed only if a single amino group and a single carboxyl group are available for reaction. Therefore, it is necessary to block some groups and to activate others to prevent unwanted reactions. The amino group of the first amino acid of the desired peptide is blocked with a third butyl oxycarbonyl or t boc group yielding a t boc amino acid. The carboxyl group of this amino acid is activated by reacting it with a reagent such as dicyclohexyl carbodiimide or DCC. The free amino group of the next amino acid to be linked attacks the activated carboxyl leading to the formation of a peptide bond and the release of dicyclohexyl urea. The carboxyl group of the resulting dipeptide is activated with DCC and reacted with the free amino group of the amino acid that will be the third residue in the peptide. This process is repeated until the desired peptide is synthesized. Exposing the peptide to dilute acid removes the t boc protecting group from the first amino acid by leaving peptide bonds intact. Peptides containing more than 100 amino acids can be synthesized by sequential repetitions of the preceding reactions. Linking the growing peptide chain to an insoluble matrix such as polystyrene beads further enhances efficiency. A major advantage of this solid phase method is that the desired product at each stage is bound to beads that can be rapidly filtered and washed and so there is no need to purify intermediates. All reactions are carried out in a single vessel eliminating losses caused by repeated transfers of products. Sequence is first anchored to the polystyrene beads. The t boc protecting group of this amino acid is then removed. The next amino acid in the protected t boc form and dicyclohexyl carbodiimide the coupling agent are added together. After the peptide bond forms, excess reagents and dicyclohexyl urea are washed away leaving the desired dipeptide product attached to the beads. Additional amino acids are linked by the same sequence of reactions. At the end of the synthesis, the peptide is released from the beads by adding hydrofluoric acid which cleaves the carboxyl ester anchor without disrupting peptide bonds. Protecting groups on potentially reactive side chains such as that of lysine are also removed at this time. This cycle of reactions can be readily automated which makes it feasible to routinely synthesize peptides containing about 50 residues in good yield and purity. In fact, the solid phase method has been used to synthesize interferons of about 155 residues that have antiviral activity and ribonuclease of about 124 residues that is catalytically active. Here you can see a schematic representation of amino acid activation and in figure B you can find the solid phase peptide synthesis. Before we attend the next session, Please try to answer the following questions. First one, write a short note on primary structure. Two, what are biologically active peptides? Write a short note on peptide sequencing. Write a short note on peptide synthesis. Here are some books for your reference. Leninger's Principles of Biochemistry by Nelson D. N. Cox M. Published by Freeman and Company, New York in 2005. 
Cell and Molecular Biology Concepts and Experiments, second edition by Carp G, published by Wiley in 1999. Biochemistry, fifth edition by Jeremy M. Berg, John L. Taimoksko, and Lubert Stryer, published by Freeman in 2002. Hope you could understand the basic principles of primary protein structure. See you next time. Until then, bye.